I'm now very pleased. To, I'm now very pleased to welcome Hitendra Wadwa. As professor at Columbia Business School and founder of the Matora Institute, Hitendra has coached dozens of Fortune 100 C-suite executives and taught more than 10,000 MBAs, executives, doctors, lawyers, social activists, and educators. His class on personal leadership and success is one of the most popular at Columbia Business School, for which he has won the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence. His widely acclaimed research and teaching on leadership have been covered by Fortune, CNN, BBC, World Service, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Inc., and Forbes. His weekly podcast, Intersections, dissolves the boundaries between science and spirituality, East and West profit and purpose, and the inner and outer to help us explore our full potential in life and work through conversations with exemplary thinkers and practitioners of our time across a diversity of disciplines. The chat will remain on throughout the presentation to enable us all to connect around the topics that Tender will be discussing. After the presentation, we'll take audience questions. If you'd like to submit a question to be answered live, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can in the time allowed. I'm now very, very pleased to welcome Hitendra Wadwa. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kiara. Greetings, everyone. It's uh, a joy to be here with all of you. Give me a moment. I'm just going to set up my screen so that you can see um, my presentation as well. Uh, bear with me one second. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I wanna start just by sharing with you what a joy and privilege it is to be here. Um, Columbia has been not just my professional platform over the last about 18 years. Um, over time, it's really become sort of like family. Um, I remember this one moment where I was, you know, pulling my hair a little bit with like all the things I had to do. And amongst them were these three students who wanted to talk to me about this or that, you know, uh, as part of the just like advisory, you know, role that professors play from time to time outside the classroom. And I remember I went through almost like a shift of consciousness when I realized, but like Hitendra, these are not just like three other small little tasks on your to-do list. This is family, <laughs> this is family. And over time, you know, that connection to me has just grown. Um, I'm happy to say that over the last, you know, three years, my daughter has become an undergraduate student at Columbia College, is really soaking it all in. And so, so it's very real for me, <laughs> you know, this family connection I feel with, uh, with all of you, all right? So uh, it's a joy to be here with all of you. And I'm grateful to, um, to the team that has organized and put this together, you know, Gibson, Natalie, Donna, and Kiara, you as well. Uh, so my passion over the last about 15 odd years has been this topic. What are the laws of success in life and in leadership? Now, why am I saying leadership? Why am I not saying like work, you know, or, or something like that? You will see that um, logic, you know, unfold in the next few minutes. So just like stay with that theme though, just in your mind for a while. And it's led to this class that Kiara mentioned and ultimately this book that has just recently been published. But Columbia has been very formative for me as a place where these ideas and thoughts that have been incubated, have been tested, have been challenged by the students amongst others and ultimately refined and codified to the point where I'm feeling a little bit of peace now. You know, I remember when this book, when I, you know, dotted the last I and crossed the last T and offered it back to the publisher, ultimately, I walked over to my wife and I said, you know, Renu, I think I can die in peace now. <laughs> so, so there is a certain level of closure I'm feeling at this stage of the journey, 15 years into the arc of this, with a lot of stumbles and struggles along the way. Uh, and so what I want to share with you, what is it that I've learned and discovered about these laws? Uh, so um, the first thing I want to I share is that um, there is an outer and then there is an inner approach to thinking about success. The outer approach, for example, is something like Alfred Nobel, you know, here who's, um, you know, for a while in his life, a very successful discoverer and scientist and entrepreneur and, um, you know, doing really well for himself, discovers one day that actually the world is going to look at him very with a very dim view because he has been the inventor of dynamite, which has been used in a lot of wars. 
And so he migrates his life to start the Nobel Foundation and the Nobel Prize series that we all know him for. To me, any or all of that is still about outer success. It's about these outer markers about, you know, what will people say at my memorial service? You know, what will my obituary be in the newspapers when somebody writes it? What is, the, what is that outer mark that people are going to acknowledge me for? The reason I say that that's an outer mark is because of Bronnie Ware. So Bronnie Ware is a hospice care worker in Australia. And she wrote a powerful blog where she shared how she had in her career, often in the moments of tenderness and connection that she had with these people who were close to dying you know, in their lives, um, would ask them, you know, do you have any major regret in life? What's your, what's your biggest regret in life? And then she wrote this blog to essentially share with all of us the most common themes that were emerging. And that then got published into a book because it um, became just so popular as like a reflection piece for us. And in these biggest regrets, do you know what the biggest, biggest regret was? And so we can you know, use this moment as well to warm up and chat. So feel free to just like share your thoughts and ideas in chat. What do you think is the biggest regret of the dying? And these could be people in the, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 90s. It could also be you know, younger people perhaps just suddenly caught up you know, with a terminal illness or what have you. What's the major regret of the dying? As you think about it, um, not spending more time with friends and uh, with, fam with family, you know, missing time with family. That that does tend to be a very common hypothesis by us. Um, you know, all of you are kind of like uh, going down that same theme. It's a very common hypothesis by us. Yeah, it speaks a little bit to the conditions of our times. It's interesting because, wow, that's a beautiful one. Not saying I love you, you know, um, uh, more often. You know, Oscar, that reminds me, you know, I, I've lost one dear one, you know, my father. And what you've shared is, 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 often something that comes back to me, I wish I'd said, I love you, you know, more to him. You know, we had that kind of relationship where, where things were more unspoken than spoken on some of these dimensions. There were hugs, but there wasn't as many words. And, and uh, I have felt sometimes that that would be nice to do. So I've started to say more of that since then with my mom and with my daughter and, 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 and you know, and others, right, wife and others. Uh, but thank you for that. It turns out that the, um, the biggest regret of the dying was that, you know, I think I lived my life more true to other people's needs and less true to my own self. Less true to my own self. It's a little bit sobering, isn't it? When you think of it that way. And um, that's what I call inner success. Inner success is where when the curtains of your life are dropping down, right? And you have played a certain role on that stage of life you realize as you come out for your last bow, right? That actually speaking, it's not the audience's applause that you were hungering for. It is the peace of mind that I played my role well. I did what I was meant to do in this life before the curtain falls down. So that's inner success. So the thing is, you and I and all of us, we struggle in this tussle between inner and outer because on the one hand, we do want you know, love and connection and support from the world. We want promotions, we want admiration, we want, we want financial success, career success and everything. But on the other hand, you know, we also want to live a life of authenticity or being true to ourselves. And some of us give up one for the other. You know, let's say, for example, some of my MBA students might say, Professor, you know, for the next few years, I'm going to go and, you know, kind of like earn the maximum I can and, you know, live out this life and, you know, acquire certain, you know, career progress milestones and all of that. And then at that point, I can think about sort of like, you know, really following my calling. But then what happens is I've also noticed that over time, you know, it's hard, you know, we, we start, you know, going after that rat race, and then we want more and more, and then it's kind of harder to pull back. And then your hair is more salt than pepper. And before you know it, you're actually, you know, having a brawny wear hold your hand and ask you, what's your biggest regret in life? Yeah, Peggy, that's a beautiful um, connection to make with Frank Sinatra's song. Um, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and Leonie, I think you're, you're referring to Shakespeare's words, isn't it? Yeah. To thine own self be true. Now, there's another part to that uh, statement from Shakespeare. It's a beautiful statement. 
uh, in a way where he says, to thine own self be true, and then it follows, as night follows day, that thou canst not be false to any other man. Um, I actually dissect that in the last page of my book. Uh, and I talk about how to interpret the last part of it, which is why is it the case that when you are true to yourself, you will not be false to any other person. If you want to hypothesize on that, I'd love for you to just like offer up ideas and chat. Why is it that being true to yourself actually makes you never be false to any other person? Anyway, I've, I've got some ideas and thoughts on that on the last page in the book. For now, I will not let this digression go on for any longer. Let me come back to the, um, you know, the, the next thought I want to offer up to you which is that when we think about this tussle, to me, it is a false dichotomy. In other words, we are not really pursuing success in the right way. If we find there's a tension between our outer life and our inner life, if these are not in harmony. And so what I want to do next is over the next few, you know, about 30 odd minutes, right? Give us a chance to unpack this a little bit and see the possibilities of bringing a path together for us in life that is going to be a path that takes us both to inner and outer success at the same time. So let's talk about inner success first. This is Gandhi. You might see him there in uh, very different clothes from the rest of the you know, folks in this, in this uh, picture. And he is sitting there. Uh, there he is. Let me, let me, <laughs> you know, there, there you're seeing him, right? Uh, the the bald headed gentleman in the white, white shawl around him. So Gandhi in that moment was in Britain in, 19, in the 1931. And he'd gone there to advance India's cause, you know, for Indian, in Indian independence. And he gave a speech to parliament, you know, on that visit. And in that speech, um, you know, he spoke for about two hours to make a case for India's independence. And after that, a British journalist came over to Gandhi's assistant and he said, how did Mr. Gandhi do it? He spoke for two hours and he spoke so eloquently, so clearly, so persuasively, and he didn't use any notes. How did he do it without any notes? And Gandhi's assistant smiled and he looked at him and he said, you know, in your case and my case, we think one thing, we feel another, we say a third and we do a fourth. And that's why, you know, that's why we need notes. In the case of Gandhi, what he thinks and says and does and feels, it's all the same. So he doesn't need any notes. And if you think about it, isn't that a beautiful definition of what it means to be true to yourself? Where, what do you think, what do you say, what do you do, what do you feel? I mean, it's all the same. And yet I would offer to you, in our quest in modern times to liberate ourselves from the shackles of patriarchs and, you know, you know uh, just priests and, and um, you know, the, the, the kings of the past who would impose on us a certain social order and demand and expect that these are the kinds of people you can marry and you cannot marry these people and you have to work on these professions and not these because of where you were born and who you were. You know, we are seeking to unshackle ourselves from those. And as we do that, and more and more of this hunger arises in modern society to express, you know, whoever we are, what are the consequences of that? You know, at some level, yes, more physical freedom on the outside, but where is it taking us on the inside? You know, today there is, you know, all these acute issues with drug addiction and suicide and mental health. And I would offer to you that we really have to pause and re-examine in a very thoughtful way, what is the true hunger in humanity? And what is the path that we have to take towards authenticity in our true self? And the insight that I offer up in the book is that actually speaking, this approach of just um, being able to indulge you know, every impulse that we have and to be able to share and express every emotion or thought that we have is really, making us fall into the trap of instant gratification. And there is enough research out there today in psychology that shows that actually speaking, those of us who get you know, caught up in that trap of instant gratification actually end up having poorer long-term outcomes in our relationships, in our health, and in our happiness, and in our success. Um, and so there's got to be a different way to get to that Gandhian outcome than purely just feel free to express and feel and say and do whatever you want. And that way is when we first pause and ask ourselves, well, if I've got to be true to myself, what is my true self? What is my true self? Because when I look within, I see many selves. You know, there's a part of me that wants to please you. There's a part of me that only wants to please me. There's a part of me that wants to work hard, part of me that wants to be lazy. 
part of me that wants to indulge, you know, in this addiction and a part of me that, you know, wants to hold back because I know it's going to be bad for my health. So I have many competing selves within me. There's a war going on within me. There are heroes and villain, villains within me. And so the first step towards being true to yourself is to actually identify which is your true self and which are your false friends. And to that end, I would offer to you that your true self amongst all these competing selves is what I call your inner core. Your inner core is the space within you from where your highest potential arises. When you are at your core, then you are beyond ego, beyond attachments, beyond insecurities. You are transcendent from any impulse and habits and even aspects of your personality that might be hindering you and hurting you. You are deeply committed to noble and beautiful causes. That part is your inner core. I'll share a story with you shared by one of our executive MBA students here at Columbia when he was taking my class and you know, he was kind enough to share the story with the whole class. He said, you know, um, 12 years ago, um, the following situation happened in my life. I was struggling with drug addiction. And at some point I overdosed, I landed up in the hospital. During this period, I had distanced myself from my family who just had it with me, you know, after a lot of pleadings and trials and struggles, they just were not able to persuade me to leave this habit. And I'd moved away from them. I hadn't seen my mother for two years. Now I'm in hospital with this drug overdose and my mother flies in to meet me and she comes over and I'm grimacing, you know, cause I'm feeling like, oh, she's going to come and she's going to, you know, just again, just invade on me and just sort of go all these, you know, scoldings and just, you know, appeals and all of that. And he says, but she actually walks in and she holds my hand and she looks into my eyes and she says, my son, I'm only here to say one thing to you. And it's really a question that I want to ask you to ask yourself, which is, if this is the way you keep living your life, do you think that you are being really true to yourself? Do you think you're being really true to yourself? And I don't need you to answer this to me right now, but you know, can I just invite you to think about it? And he said, that's it. You know, she, she, she just left after that. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And he said that that became the catalyst for my transformation. You know, I, I realized how much of a deeper hunger I had for manifesting beautiful things in the world and how all of those were gonna get so severely compromised if I continue to live this path that I was of the immediate indulgence in the pleasure of what it is that the drug was giving me. And I, I found this deeper quest within me that I wanted to really honor. And that led me to start going to rehab. I came out of rehab of 11 years ago. And I'm just, you know, joyfully telling you today, all of you that I've never taken drugs since then. Um, so to me, that question that she asked was really a way to get him connected with his inner core, because we all have it, we all have it in us. And, you know, credit to her for seeing that as the simplest and most powerful transformative device for him, and all credit to him for actually listening in and tuning in to the inner wisdom that he ultimately was able to access from his own core, but catalyzed by the words of his mother. Okay, so that's the inner success idea. That inner success starts by identifying who you are at your core, honoring it, and finding a way to let it shine through in everything you do. Now, what about outer success? That's the uh, next thing I want to talk to you about. But before I do that, I want to just um, invite you again in chat to share your reactions and thoughts on what I've just offered to you. This idea that within you and me, there is this space of highest potential where we are beyond ego and attachment. We drift into it and we drift out of it. Sometimes we are closer to it and sometimes we are not. Only you will know when you are closer to it. Others can sense it a little bit from the outside, but you are the one who's observing and tuning in to that core within you versus not. The one thing I would offer to you is that, you know, across all of the social and political and geopolitical and other divides that otherwise we are so challenged by in the world where it doesn't look like, you know, you can actually bring the world together around one unified set of beliefs. This idea that within each of us lies this very special place, you know, our inner core, 
interesting thing is I have not found a single person who comes to me and says, hey, Tendra, I don't have a core. <laughs> you know, I don't have that special place. You know, I, I never found myself going anywhere close to that. I've just never found that. So it's to me a little bit hope, you know, hope inducing that maybe there are possibilities for us to find a way to create like a common framework, a common language. Perhaps this could be part of it, but you know, there are ways for us to have some deep unified beliefs, even across faiths and beyond faiths and across political and social divides. Okay, so out of success, let's talk about out of success now. So I've been researching a number of these disciplines of science, psycho psychology, psychotherapy, neuroscience, sociology and beyond. And I've had the privilege of actually going around the country and um, meeting up with and partnering with some of the leading lights in these disciplines. Like for example, Dr. David Burns uh, from Stanford University, a preeminent exponent of cognitive behavior therapy. Dr. Dan Siegel uh, from UCLA, a preeminent uh, you know, psychotherapist of our times today and a writer of our times today around themes of integrating you know, neuroscience and um, you know, spirituality and mindfulness into, into psychotherapy. Um, and I've had some of these, you know, leading lights today from these scientific disciplines in my podcast called Intersections as well. So I've learned a lot from integrating across these different branches of this very exploding and luminous scientific knowledge tree today. In addition, I've been studying these um, kinds of like figures from history who leave such a positive and beautiful mark, like a Mandela and, um, and an Eleanor Roosevelt and a Mother Teresa and um, an Abraham Lincoln and, and a Gandhi. And I've also, over time, through our institute at Mentora, uh, which is an institute that I founded about 11 years ago, you know, we have um, um, collected together a thousand plus moments of exemplary leadership, dialogues and, you know, presentations and meetings and speeches and conflicts and how they were resolved by these leaders. These are not just iconic people, but also just everyday people. Let me give you an example of an everyday person and how that person has... Um, you know, done something really special as an extraordinary, you know, exemplary act of leadership. So there's this research scientist, right? And she, this is a real story, right? She was really struggling in her relationship with her boss, who's this eminent, you know, scientist. And she really wanted to work in his lab because, you know, he was otherwise a very positive influence and figure and they were doing really great work. But he was a temperamental manager. He would have his on days and off days. And, you know, she was wanting to kind of like figure out how to deal with him, you know, in, in times when he just wasn't that, you know, collaborative. And so this one time after much coaching, she goes over to him and this is how she, you know, practices this new kind of illuminated form of, of leadership that she has learned, you know, in the last uh, few months. She goes over and she says, Dr. So-and-so, did you look at that research paper I left on your desk because we need to send it out for publication? And he's in one of his bad mood days. And he says, oh, that paper, it was so terrible. I, I threw it in the trash bin. You know, how, how would I react? How would you react in a moment like that, right? But somebody that you have respect for, that, you know, there's a reason why you're here, you know, in his labs. And yet, like, this is how he's being in the, in the moment. So this is what she said. She said, Dr. So-and-so, you know, you're so right. The writing in this paper is not at your level. And in fact, I really appreciate her writing. When I was in graduate school, I used to be so inspired by, you know, the quality of the writing that used to come from your labs. But while the writing is not as good, the research we have done here is actually really, really, really powerful. The findings are really interesting and will be setting the scientific community on fire. And I know that you want to, in a very timely way, put this research in the hands of the scientific community. So can I, you know, ask you that, you know, can I bring the paper back and can you help me edit it and refine it so that, you know, I can up my game in terms of my writing. It may not be at your level today, but it can improve. And you know, the, 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 her boss, like he's soothed, he's a little bit calmer. So he says, okay, you know, bring the paper over and she does. And he says, cut this line and, you know, take this off and all of that. And he approves it and goes out for publication and it wins an award. So that's an example of like an exemplary moment of leadership, like who was leading in that moment and who was following, right? Um, that I like to collect. I like to collect these moments and dissect them under, if you want to call it like a leadership microscope to understand what are the underlying common themes, you know, in, in these kinds of behaviors that we see from iconic and everyday heroes. And so the main question I'm trying to answer is how do ordinary people do extraordinary things like what she just did there, right? And um, and, and so, so, so the, the conclusion I've come to is that what these people are doing really well is that they are approaching every moment, every moment with the intention 
of seeking to be a leader. Now, a leader doesn't mean that you have power and authority necessarily over others. You could be the junior most person in the room. You could be the least experienced person in the room. You could have the least authority in the room. But what they do is they aspire to forge a common positive purpose with the people that they're engaged with, and then to bring out their best and to bring out the best in others in the service of that purpose. Now, when you define leadership this way, all right, now see, some of you may be very invested in leadership based on your role and aspirations in life. Some of you may be finding this a little bit of a new language. You know, it's not something that you're very personally drawn to or inspired by. But, you know, if you define it this way, then my invitation to you is to recognize that at this point, if you can make the inner choice to want to show up as a leader based on this definition of a leader, then it starts to apply to all roles in an organization, to all levels in an organization, and also all of life moments become leadership moments. All of life moments become leadership moments because at the end of the day, when you're you know, spending time with a friend or with a loved one or, or what have you, why would you not want to show up in those interactions, bringing out your best and seeking to bring out their best? And there's always a common positive purpose to those moments. So that is um, a very unifying construct through which you can also bring all these different initiatives in an organization under one umbrella, under one guiding principle, which is what can we do to light a fire amongst our employees so that, and, or within my family or within my community, so that all of us are striving to live this ethos to make leadership an inner, inner choice as something that we are just deeply committed to wanting to do in all moments in the service of a common positive purpose. Now, of course, what this uh, does is invites us to ask, what is best? When we say, you know, bring out the best in yourself, what is best? So I'm going to go there next. But let me pause here also for a moment and invite you to use chat because I know there's so much of richness to your own perspectives and there's so much that we gain from, you know, just um, learning and sharing and connecting with each other. And so let's take advantage of chat to have you react to this definition of leadership. What would it do to our communities? What would it do to our schools? What would it do to our families? What would it do to our nation if we were to find a way to make this a core value in how we show up in the world? Now, of course, what is best? One way to think about best is based on these outer qualities that 20th century science was so invested in, which is what is the magic formula of the five or seven or eight things that you need to do if you want to succeed in life. You want to be a great athlete. You want to be a great leader. You want to be an inspiring speaker. You want to, you know, et cetera, right? And, you know, some of those qualities are you have to be decisive and adaptive and agreeable and whatever. But actually, the funny thing is, you look at each of these qualities. Now, I'm a mathematician, really, in disguise. I, my passion in school and college and really all the way to graduate school and my PhD was... Um, was math. And as a mathematician, I look at each of these qualities and I can offer you that there are situations where the opposite of that quality is actually a very critical quality. For example, you might say it's important to be adaptive. Well, there are certain situations where it'll be very important to be tenacious, to keep fighting the good fight. There are situations where you should be very agreeable, but also situations where you should be very assertive, you know, et cetera, right? And so, I don't know, when, you, when I look at life situations, when I look at, you know, these iconic leaders from history and these moments of exemplary leadership, what I find is the way to succeed, the way to be your best is to be everything and the complete opposite, everything and the complete opposite. It just depends on the situation. You know, do you feel like that sometimes? <laughs> this relentless demands on you that make you need to show up in like 17 different ways. You know, there's no one six, sing, single fixed way that is going to allow you to be a great parent a great friend, a great manager, you know, et cetera, all right? And so if, if you, if you kind of are open to leaning into that with me, how is it that we can be our best by being everything in the complete opposite? Well, one way to think about it is that you can get there by first anchoring yourself in your inner core because that steadiness we want, that place of home that we want to be anchored in, is your inner core. It's not going to come by getting yourself stuck in a certain outer groove in terms of a certain way of thinking about your personality or your behavior or your habits or your leadership qualities. Because from the outside, you know, the world is shifting and changing and different personalities, you know, will show up in your life and you're going to have to find a way to have different strokes with different folks. 
But all of that can emerge from a place of steadiness within, and that is your inner core. That is your inner core. And so this approach to thinking about how to succeed in life is that you need to interact with so many different individuals, communities, et cetera. Maybe the way that you can get to where you want to is activate your core. In other words, come from that best place within you, your authentic self, then seek to project certain forces out there, which I'm going to come back and introduce to you in a minute. And the purpose of doing that is to activate the core in others. And when you're at your core and others around you are at their best self to at their core, well, then you get this common core, you know, and you must have seen that at times, you know, that a family is lit up in a really unified and beautiful and intimate way. A whole nation can be lit up the way, for example, Zelensky in Ukraine is just seeking to fire up patriotism in his people to really defend their freedom. And they're willing to take noble and beautiful sacrifices against a much larger behemoth and a force out there, right? I mean, that's an example of a whole community being lit up from their core, that common core. You see that in sports teams at times. You see that in organizations at times, which are very mission-driven, deeply committed, connected with each other. That's the high-performance state of the collective that is emerging from the individual high-performance state of every individual. And so that's my second lesson, which is activate this inner core in yourself and others. Now, how do you do that? What is there at your core? That's what you know, my book, Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, delves deeply into. What is there at our core? And you know, the shift that I went through in my initial study and ultimately teaching of leadership was to recognize that it's really important for us to not only see it in outer physical terms, and just like Einstein opened us up in the 20th century, that guys, you have no idea how much energy is packed into nature, in matter. In the same way, there is a lot of energy packed into who we are from within. And I've, over time, developed a model of five core energies that I see as the most central. They're sort of like the DNA of leadership, the DNA of success these five core energies. The first of which is purpose. And purpose is about having a deep connection to your values for why you are living this life. What is this purpose that you're seeking to manifest? Going on that quest. And if you don't have purpose, you have purpose. Your purpose is to find your purpose. Because why would you want to live life in a way so that, you know, that moment comes with, you know, brawny wear by your side. And now you're saying, I regret that I didn't live life in alignment with my purpose. So let's be on fire to go and explore our highs and lows and really connect with the most core yearnings within each of us. And in doing so, we generate a lot of resilience because you know conditions in life will always change. Some people will love us, then they won't love us. You know, we'll get some success in the world and we will not get some other success. We'll be popular and not popular. We'll be healthy and not healthy. These things are just gonna happen in the cards that life deals us day to day. But if you are always seeking to do your best with the resources you have to express on the outside your values and your purpose, well, then that's the game that you can just keep playing adaptively you know, every week, every month, and every year. Your resources keep changing, conditions keep changing, and you just keep reaffirming and re-expressing. And so it, purpose makes you very anchored from within and very agile from outside, very fluid on the outside. Wisdom is the second of these energies. And wisdom is about finding the truth in all situations, not letting your emotions or distorted thoughts or limiting beliefs or a you know, self-defeating mindset ever you know, limit you from being able to see the possibilities, from being able to carve out the pathways, from being able to attune yourself to the underlying reality of how people are feeling and what they're saying and the 17 different nuances of the audience you're talking to, et cetera. Always striving to tune into more and more and more because as they say, the truth shall set you free. That is the wisdom energy. The third of these is the love energy. And love is about recognizing that, you know, the universe is always inviting us to take joy in the collective joy of us and others, to find success in the collective success. Yes, we want to be independent and free and express our own natural self, but we are also being invited by life to be interdependent and interconnected. That is the energy of love. As Rumi said, this beautiful Sophie, Sufi poet, he said, love is the bridge between you and everything. 
the fifth of these energies is growth. And growth is about recognizing that I'm a work in progress, that I may have a certain character or a personality or something today. There's no reason why I cannot regroove my brain over time to get myself to, over time, choose to become the best version of myself. And the fifth of these energies is self-realization. And self-realization is realizing that behind it all, I am pure spirit. When I take that walk in nature and I connect with the most graceful and serene and beautiful inklings within me, when I do that prayer or that chant or I meditate or I'm in the company of an inspiring person or I read a piece of literature of somebody going on a hero's journey and just stirs something really deep within me, that is a glimpse I'm getting into this ineffable part of who I am that lies beyond thought and feelings and sensory experiences of life, the spirit at the very core of my being. And when I can connect with it, I feel whole. I feel joyful. I feel at peace. And now I can show up to do my parenting or to do my community service or to lead in the workplace or perform my professional duties. And I can show up to do all of this stuff with no unhealthy hungers that I want to be the smartest person in this room or I want all the power in this situation. You know, all of those unhealthy hungers go away because they're already being very beautifully fed and nurtured from within. Because all the things I ever wanted are there at the very core of my being. That is the self-realization energy. And so that's the third thing I've learned is that, you know, you get to pursue out of success by freeing yourself up to be able to show up in the world and do what's right. And to get there, we need to be activated at the core. And to activate that core, we need to be nurturing purpose, wisdom, love, growth, and self-realization. Now, there's a lot of balance in these energies. You know, you take love, for example. By itself, it can be at times blindsided. You know, you, you love this team or this individual so much that you're always wanting to protect them. But then you're not letting them grow to their full potential. And so by giving them comfort today, you might be limiting the chance of growth in the future. Or by protecting them, you are actually doing a disservice to the larger organization and the larger mission of what it is that you know, this organization is seeking to manifest because they're underperforming and you're just still not being able to kind of like do something you know, very decisive about it, et cetera, right? And so that means that purpose and wisdom need to be in, you know, connected and blended with the love energy. Um, and so when you can open yourself up to very fluidly activating and moving from one energy to the next, that is when the full balanced approach to success arises. Now, how do we get there? How do we get there? How do we cultivate and nurture these five energies? There is a whole series of chapters in the book around that. But what I'm going to do is move beyond the book to the work that we've been doing at my institute and my foundation, and of course, also in my class at Columbia. Because I'm, you know, I'm going to give you a, a few insights of the very practical possibilities of reframing and thinking the, you know, the kind of interpersonal and what traditionally has been called soft skills or leadership skills and how to think and approach and master them. This is the way that typically these ideas are taught that, hey, you know, you want to get around and get along in the world. Well, then you have to learn how to have difficult conversations and feedback and influencing and inspiring people and, you know, all, all of these things and listen to these TED talks and, you know, read these books and, you know, take these workshops and classes and what have you, right? Okay, but I would offer to you that this is a very overwhelming and complex way of, of doing things. And, you know, often we read about this, we, you know, we, we, we listen to a talk, but then we go back in our life and we forget about it. You know, it's very hard for us to stay on top of all of this. As opposed to that, here's a completely different approach, completely different approach. Remember that research scientist and her lab director? When she went up to him and she said, Dr. So-and-so, you're so right. The writing in the paper is not at your level. You know, at the same time, the research here is very good. And you should help me with my writing because you want this out there, isn't it? Was she having a difficult conversation with him? Was she inspiring him? Was she giving him feedback? Was she building trust with him? Was she inviting him to give her feedback? Was she coaching him? Was she managing his performance? Was she influencing him? Wasn't she doing all of the above in 35 seconds? So isn't it insane for us to think about these as being like separate qualities that we have to have separate experts and separate frameworks and separate toolkits? Because fundamentally, it's just about one thing. She was activating his core and she was activating her core and she was doing it from a place of common purpose with a loving energy of like Dr. So-and-so, I really love your writing with wisdom in it in terms of, look, I mean, you know, I, 
I have something true in what I'm saying, which is this paper is a good paper, and you have something true in what you're saying, which is the writing of the paper is not at your level. And the breakthrough that I've come to over the last few years is that the practical way of doing all of this is to translate these energies into simple, simple, simple actions. In her case, for instance, she used these five actions. She first disarmed him by finding something to agree. The writing in the paper is not as good. She appreciated him for his writing. She fused opposites by saying the writing is not good, but the research is really good. She appealed to his values then. And after appealing to his values, which is like, you know, you want this research out there, don't you, in the scientific community? She also then asked for his advice, which was a growth energy thing. And these actions are transformative. They're simple and transformative if you perform them from the inside, genuinely. You have to be genuinely in a place where you agree with the other individual, even though you're fundamentally disagreeing with them. Genuinely in a place where you can appreciate a quality in them, some, something about them to create that warmth, to create that human connection. You are genuinely appealing to their values because you do believe these are good values you know, for them to offer up in the world, you know, et cetera. So these are inner actions first, shifting your own thoughts and feelings from within before they become outer actions. And so that's the fourth of my, my ideas and thoughts for you, which is express these five core energies using a simple set of actions. At Mentora, we've identified about 25 actions, like the kinds you see here, that recurrently come up, recurrently come up in exemplary moments of leadership, like those thousand plus data points that we've identified, like this research scientist story. So it's really cool because it makes you realize that actually this is all doable. There's just actually a small number of actions that you need to participate in. And so this last part of what I want to share with you before I open it up for, for, for questions as well and comments from you is a breakthrough that has emerged over the last few months. Because now, you know, as the arc of this work, you know, gets to the stage of maturity, I've been really struggling with how do we get people to form these action grooves in their brain so that this so that this actually becomes really, really, really um, an important, um, you know, kind of like daily pursuit for people. And for that, what I've realized is that, you know, besides the work we do in the classroom, it's really important that people can make these actions flow in their everyday life and work. And so the method I've come up with is the following, which is, to have people, and, and we have a digital tool for this, you know, a, an app or something that you can, you know, do on your computer. And I've implemented it in my executive MBA program, literally over just the last month. And I'm getting such beautiful results from it that I'm excited and happy and joyfully offering this news up to you, right? Which is, the method is, um, let's get to develop more habits within us by using meetings as a forcing device for us to step out of our comfort zone and practice new actions. A meeting could be with a loved one where you are having a delicate conversation, a loved one where you really wanna build more intimacy and regrain the trust that you had in past years, or it could be a negotiation at work, it could be a job interview that you're doing, it could be a speech that you're gonna give you know, to your uh, people at work, et cetera, right? And so you pick a meeting, then plan it first by setting a goal for the meeting. You know, like I want to inspire these people or I want to build trust with this person. I want to influence these people. I want to manage the conflict between us. I want to listen and learn from this person, et cetera. So set a goal for this meeting. We have a pull down menu. You can pick from many, many different goals that we've come up with based on our research, right? The typical goals people have. Then you are recommended three to five actions from these 25 odd actions that we found recurrently come up, purpose-driven actions, wisdom-driven actions, et cetera. You recommended three to five actions that will help you against your goal. So if your goal is to inspire them, for example, one of the actions might be take them on a hero's journey. You can, if you want, quickly look at that action and remember the toolkit you know, associated with that action and then book 15 minutes of time prior to the meeting. And that's the prepare stage where in those 15 minutes, you will do like, a, for example, a little bit of prep. It could be, for example, a little guided meditation that we recorded around that action to help you prepare one of you know, the actions you're gonna do. It could be to remind yourself of a positive intention you create for the meeting and an affirmation that you have for the meeting. They give you recommended affirmations that you can use. Affirmations are words you keep repeating in your mind, which when you do, they anchor you in a certain feeling, a certain way of thinking about you know, situations and it then influences your behavior in a positive way in the meeting. And then you go do the meeting and then you come back and review it you know, after you've, after you return from it. And what we are finding is that this approach is actually yielding breakthrough, breakthrough results, right? And so it's really, really cool to see how people are being able to suddenly realize that, you know, I don't actually have to work, um, 
you know, in, in a very sort of long-term way to bring out, you know, more grace in my ways of doing things, to bring out um, more wisdom, you know, more connection, et cetera. But in fact, um, by just pausing for 15 minutes in the rush of life, but by getting prompts as suggestions on which energy and which actions might be useful in this meeting, I just find magically that I am in a much better place to get to the outcomes I was looking for. It's kind of as though, you know, we already have it within us to be really thoughtful and extraordinary. And we are just not giving ourselves the permission, the time, and a little bit of prep to get there. That's what I'm learning in you know, discovering from this. I'll be happy to share more about the findings of this research in the next few months and weeks as we start to codify the data from this, uh, this work. Um, I am very hopeful to publish this in Harvard Business Review in the next year as well. Um, there are ways in which you can access, um, you know, just staying in touch and, and more of the fuller stream of the, the work that continues to happen in, in, um, in, in this research that I'm doing on, on success in life and leadership. Um, and I'm going to, as a follow-up, you know, in the email that you get from our alumni team, give you a couple of links from where you can stay in touch or read my newsletter or just ask or inquire, or if you want to use this tool and practice it in your own life, since it's just coming out from the pilot stage right now, I'm just happy to put it in your hands as well. So you can taste some of the possibilities here as well. And so just in closing, as a final thought, um, you know, when I spoke about these remarkable figures from history, Gandhi, Mandela, et cetera, turns out that the greatest lesson I've learned about them is that while they were extraordinary leaders, they were ordinary people. They were ordinary people. Lincoln had one year of schooling. Mother Teresa and Eleanor Roosevelt had no college. Uh, Gandhi and Mandela of their own confession were poor students. You know, it's, 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 it's remarkable how ordinary people can do extraordinary things. It's just a question about activating your core, um, nurturing these energies, taking these small steps to put this kind of learning into the flow of life, into the flow of work. And um, anyway, that's, um, yeah, that's my story. Thank you all uh, so much for your graciousness and energy in the chat as well. And I turn it back to you, Kiara. Thank you so much, Professor Wadwa. Like that, that was great. And especially the activating the core and especially this last bit that you mentioned, right? How ordinary folks can be extraordinary leaders. Like, I think that's something that we all tap into. Uh, we do have a few questions from the chat. Everyone's candidness as well with their questions. So the first question I see here, in today's society, too many are tapping into their villainous core. Can they be redirected to the positive core? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a powerful point. Such a powerful point. Well, you know, I'm just moved to share a story. Um, one of the executives in my class once, um, he shared the story. He said, um, I'm a secret service agent. And this one time I was in the backyard with my wife and this man breaks in with a gun and he comes over to us and he says, one of you go into the house and bring me all your belongings. And I mean, your, 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 all your valuables, you know, the, you know, any jewelry and cash. Meanwhile, the other one I'm gonna, you know, keep here under the gun. And he says, I was like figuring out what I'm gonna do. And my wife just jumps in and she says to him, I can't believe you're doing this. I mean, you're putting your life at risk. You're putting our life at risk. And, you know, there must be something seriously, you know, in your life that is not going right because otherwise why would we be compelled to do something like this. And I, I'm deeply concerned about it, you know? And um, my husband and I, we were just gonna sit down here, have some, you know, wine and some dinner. And why don't you do that? You know, put your gun down, come and sit here with us, talk to us because I'm deeply concerned. I wanna know more about what's happening in your life. And the secret service agent says like, I, I was like, you know, so stunned. And, and he actually did that. He sat with us and he put his gun down. And of course it was a, you know, harsh, you know, environment for him and you know the things we heard were really opening our hearts up to him you know it, it was not easy for us to recognize what he'd gone through in life and at the end of it you know he was reaching out for his gun and I said sir you can leave but you can't take your gun and, and he left you know that day and and he said the next day there was a knock on the door and it was him and I was bracing myself like he's going to ask for his gun now and instead he looked at me and said sir I've not come for my gun I, I just wanted to thank your wife for what she did for me yesterday and I want to thank you too because you were um you know, it, it had a major impact on me. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I mean, like, what can I say? You know, we could, we could, you know, do a whole class on on that beautiful question you asked. You know, how do we 
get people back to the, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even call it the negative core. I would like to believe the negative stuff is more in some of the messed up grooves in our brain. And the core is the true self within you. There's no true evil self. There's only a true virtuous self. Because every one of us, every one of us wants to be a hero, you know, to go on a luminous and beautiful journey. And yet there are these grooves in the brain would get in the way at times. You know what, that's a good segue into our next question. And, and I really like the anecdotes that you're using because these are real stories that can happen to ordinary folks as well. So just understanding that even the solutions happen in your everyday happenings. So another question I have here, Dr. Wadua, who is going to be the follower if everyone wants to be the leader? It's funny you say that because I've been just giving chat a little bit along the way and that question stuck in my mind. Like, Catherine, I've got to find a way to actually get to respond to her question. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. And it's a great question. It's a great question. See, Catherine, firstly, look at the way I've defined leadership, right? I'm not defined leadership as the person who, you know, barks out the orders, right? That, that's not the way. I define leadership as just like being able to go in a situation and seek to bring out the best in yourself and the best in others. And two can tango. You know, four can tango in this game, a thousand can tango. We can come collectively and with that aspiration to just want to bring out the best in oneself and best in others. See, one reason why in spiritual communities, you know, over the centuries past, there has been a deep commitment to fellowship, to community, is because sometimes some people are actually being inspired by the better angels of their nature and others are being lazy or, you know, despondent and whatever. And so some will lift the others up. And on other days, the others will lift the sum up. You know, and so, uh, so Catherine, my, my, my invitation to you is to think about this more as like that back and forth, that give and take, you know, of the right, good, positive energy. Can we take that from people and can we give that to people? That's all this model talks about. But I would also say that in my studies, great leaders are great followers. Great leaders are great followers of their core principles, of their inner voice. They seek to approach leadership from a place of tremendous surrender almost renunciation. It's like an inner form of renunciation. I'm going to renounce my own personal hungers and all, you know, besides the need to protect my health and nurture my spirit and all of that. But besides that, like for fame and fortune and pride and all that, I'm going to renounce all of that, surrender that to fully tune in and listen to what is the universe trying to tell me, both from the outside in the wise counsel of advisors from the outside or the harsh criticisms of my critics within which I might find a kernel of truth. And also from the inside, the stirrings and inklings I'm getting. And they're always seeking to just be in followership, you know, of that. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. So there's one here. Does your core energy action approach work across geographies? And I just want to add in here geographies. Let's add in age and let's add in gender as well. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful question. Um, I have started a mentor foundation. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, and I know we're living through, you know, troubled and you know, pivotal times. And, um, you know, the quest for me in the foundation is to help build out a, you know, a teaching of change making that I feel like I, I would love to see come into the Columbia universities of the world to ultimately be part of the core teaching, you know, on our campuses. And so one of the things we are doing at the foundation is we've just started a youth fellowship. By the way, if you are 20 year old and in college, or if you have a nephew, niece, brother, sister, or a child or a grandchild who is of that demographic, you know, college going, please look at the Mentora Foundation and invite them to consider if they're drawn to it and inspired by it, if they're wanting to be that kind of a change maker for our fellowship. It's a fully funded thing where we're actually taking college children, giving them this teaching of the core, the energies and the actions, adding on 10 principles of change making and preparing them for careers and roles in the world across all disciplines, you know, medicine, science, arts, you know, politics, law, business, et cetera, to be, to be positive change makers. So we just launched this over this year. Columbia Law School was kind enough to give us classroom space. And we had 20 youth from all over the world come here to, uh, to Columbia, um, uh, to, to New York. And, you know, like I said, we fully funded it. There were people from Pakistan and Hong Kong and the UK and here in the US and beyond. And it's beautiful, you know, this was the first time I extended this class and this teaching from the 20 or 30 year old MBAs and the 35 year old executive MBAs and the executives we teach in our corporate work, et cetera, to the 18 to 20 year olds. And the beautiful thing is we didn't have to change a thing. You know, this conversation I'm having with you, I didn't have to change a single word, a single part of the framework. It is to me universal. And certainly, you know, Colombia is a magnet for all kinds of, 
you know, religious and international and gender and other profiles, right? And so right here, you know, this work has been honed and challenged and ultimately advanced and refined on the basis of these very beautiful, diverse and disparate voices and reactions I've been getting over the years. But it's so nice now because I get people coming up to me and saying, Professor, what you've said, you know, it's in our teachings, it's in the Torah. Or professor, you know, this is what my Islamic teachings have actually told me. Or professor, you know, I don't follow any religion, but I think what you're talking about is actually, you know, kind of like, just like the deep relationship I have with nature. So yeah, so um, that's my conviction. But, you know, feel free to challenge me. If you say, you know, I don't think it will work here or there, or, you know, I'd love to learn from you, you know, please, please do so and help guide me, inform me. Maybe it'll lead to a further refinement of the framework. Because my quest, my quest certainly is, to take it to a place of universality, because I do believe that despite our outer differences, there is a common shared human core, and it's something that you know cuts across, right? Not just um, today's humanity, but generations, generations of it. And I'm going to close with that. Actually, Einstein, and you know, I'll give back to you, Kiara, in just 30 seconds. So Einstein once um, wrote to Gandhi, and he said, um, "Mr. Gandhi, I see you doing this gesture." In your newsreel videos that I see, you know, coming out from India, what does this gesture mean? And Gandhi wrote back this to him, and these are going to be my final words to you. And then beyond that, I'll send a note through the alumni team, like I said about Mentora Foundation, the Youth Fellowship, and a couple of other invitations if you're interested. But Gandhi wrote back to him and said, "This is the Indian greeting of Namaste," and he said, "This is what it means. It means I honor that place within you, where the entire universe resides." that place within you where there is only joy and wisdom and love and peace. I honor that place within you where when you are at that place and I am at that place, there is only one of us. Thank you so much, Gibson, yeah. Chiara, Donna. That was great. That, I mean, like, you don't, <laughs> I didn't need to tell you to close. You knew how to close. That was really perfect. Um, without a doubt, everyone is interested, right? This is only the beginning, and I know we'll be interested in looking at the follow-up materials to this event today. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we don't typically have these types of conversations in the middle of our day, so this is a great pause to kind of check in with our own course. Um, you know, keep an eye out for your alumni newsletter also, and check at alumni.columbia.edu for more information about Columbia. And everyone will receive some follow-up information following today's event. But, but thank you so much, Dr. Professor. Thank you, Kiara. All the best to all of you. Thank you, Natalie and the team as well. Take care. Bye.